Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session. Okay, good afternoon in local time. Good morning to other people. Uh, we have two speakers for this session, Sohrab and Niayesh. Uh, Sohrab is from Sharif University of Technology in Tehran, and he's going to talk about gravitational microlensing. Please, Sohrab. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Can I uh, turn off my video? Maybe it's better. So, uh, I'm going to talk about gravitational lensing as an amplifier for SETI observations. I really gave this talk at the SETI Institute two weeks ago, so just that might be some people. Knew, uh, so, uh, I mean, this. Uh, so this before, uh, I mean, uh, so, um, I just keep this slide because that's for introducing our university. So the question is that uh, are we alone in the universe? Uh, um, so I, in the stack, I will introduce a new cha channel for detection of the ETI, uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. So uh, let's let me first introduce the history of the exoplanet detection or observations. So it, that it started in 1995. Uh, these two person, Mayer and Close, they got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And then after that, uh, many exoplanets has been discovered. Now we have 4,000 candidates for exoplanets. Some of the planets are in the habitables of their parent star. This means that if we, there are possibility of formation of life in the planet because of the temperature and the uh, condition, uh, life condition in this and this planets. So it, now we can ask that uh, this question again. That uh, again, I'll ask this question: Is our planet in the universe or not? Um, so uh, I'm going to introduce this uh, new channel of detection by gravitational lensing. So uh, I have a, a brief introduction on the light band in gravitation, NGR, and then we apply it for the, for uh, safety operations. So potential lensing in the of light when light go going close to a massive object. This is discovered by Einstein in relativity, and um, And uh, the uh, gravitational lensing has been observed in, in astronomy. And uh, there are uh, three different regimes of gravitational lensing. Uh, we uh, classify into the, the gravitational lensing into three classes of strong lensing. In the cosmological scale, uh, uh, we can distinguish the ages lensing. We can see the Einstein ring. We can see some uh, deformation of the background uh, forces, which is called weakling. Here also you can see the lensing, four images from quasar, and also micro lensing. I will uh, emphasize on this uh, method, and this is the length of one star by another star. So in gravitational micro lensing, uh, we have two stars. One the lens at the front and the source at the background moving with, with to each other and then uh, the gradual lensing is dynamic, dynamic and then we can make uh, switches from the source star and star moving with, with respect to each other get the magnification of the background star as a function of time this is the uh, first candidate of gravitational microlensing microlensing is in a tough wavelength so the ratio of these two one. And the characteristic angle of the lensing or characteristic angle for the image the difference the difference between images is Einstein angle and inside the galaxy is that's in milli arc second. So I have a review article with the details in the archive. Um, so in the uh, micro in, in, in the Milky Way galaxy can also define another uh, characteristic time scale for the lensing, which is called Einstein crossing time. So since 
observance and source are moving with respect to each other. So lensing is a dynamic lens of behavior. Yes. So, uh, we cannot hear you properly. Maybe if, I don't know what's the problem, but uh, can you hear me? Switch. Yes. Can you hear me now? Do you is use fine? mobile data or Wi-Fi? So no. I'm using the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. So maybe if you change to to the da mobile data. Um, uh, I I think the file is is, is is working. You had the same problem in th this morning. Or maybe I I just go out, log off, and then log in. Uh, Puri, I'm with. Okay, I I can I can connect with the mobile. I tried. Now, okay. now let me see. I think we can hear you well now. Is it fine now? Yes. I, I guess so. It's better. Yes. Okay. Okay. It's much so, better now. okay. Thank you. So, so, tell me when if it's there's. Um, is it fine now? No. Again, okay. there is noise. I think. It's there better. is noise. Yeah, I think it's better to switch to mobile data. Let's see. You will control your talk by. Uh, in your laptop, but uh, you can talk with your mobile. Maybe. Uh, Puria, can you help us? Puria? Just please, just please wait one, two more minutes to, to resolve this problem. Can you hear me? Okay. Nima? Nima, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Yes, I can hear you too. Okay. So uh, I will continue. Yes, please. So this is the characteristic. Of the Einstein code for the gravitational lensing, as you see, that's a that's a function of the distance of the lens, mass, and relative velocity, and that's in the order of one and a half months. So the gravitational lensing take place in the order of one and a half months time. Um, so uh, historically, uh, first. Uh, uh, Bodan Pashinsky in 1986 proposed uh, using gravitational microlensing as astrophysical tools to just monitor the stars in large and small Magellanic clouds and then count the microlensing events and then from the number of the events we can conclude that uh, what fraction of the halo is made of this compact objects 
that, that, that at that time that was one of the candidates for the dark matter, which is called matchers. And uh, it took uh, about 10 years of uh, experiment by mainly two group of matcha and eros. And they, they conclude that uh, less than 10% of the halo is made of this compact object. So uh, we can rule out this as a kind, as a dark matter candidate. So this is one of the first uh, uh, astrophysical applications of the gravitational microlensing. But later, it's also used for the for the exoplanet detection. So, let me just briefly give some uh, mathematical basis because we will use this mathematical basis in in uh, our discussion. So, uh, if we put uh, if if we have a source and lens and observer here in the absence of lens, light travels in the straight line. But if we put a lens here, this this light ray just received by the observer. And then we can define the time that takes from the source to get to the observer. And this is from the metric. And then we can define the potential, which is called the thermal potential. And it's the time difference between time traveling from this line and from the red line. And it has two parts, geometric part and, the, and, the, and this last part coming from the general relativistic, general relativistic effect. And uh, Next page. And uh, if we have a multiple images, then we can write this thermal potential in terms of this geometrical uh, part, which is which is the deviation from straight line, and the next next term from the gravitational from GR effects. And we can write this thermal potential in terms of the angles. So theta is the position of the image, beta is the position of the source, and this is the geometrical part, and this is the GR. GR contribution and theta is the is called the Einstein angle. So if we take a derivative from this thermal potential, the extreme point of this function, which gives us the image in a, the position of this, and uh, we can find the position of the all kind of uh, all the kind of gravitational lensing, and then this is the equation. This is called the lensing equation, and if we look at this equation mathematically, that's the map from the source plane to the image plane. So if we give a beta here, position of the image, then we can get theta position of images here. And we can define a Jacobian of transformation from the source plane to the image plane. And the inverse of this Jacobian is the amplification due to this gravitational lensing. How big, how extended our images are, is getting larger, then that will give us the, us the amplification. And and if, and if we find some some geometrical positions that the Jacobian is zero, then we will have infinity in the in the magnification, or we have a singularity in the magnification, and that's called the caustic line caustic line in the in the optics. This is this is a this is a standard technique in also in the in the optics. So if we put a glass uh, in front of the light, we'll see this caustic lines due to this, uh, in, along this line, the Jacobian of this transformation between the, between the uh, source image plane is, is infinite. Or if, if you look at the pool, you will see these caustic lines. So this happens to the, in the, in also for the gravitational lensing. So if we, you have a binary lens, like a planet, uh, like a parent star and the planet orbiting around it, and if it, if you, if you assume a relative velocity, relative motion of this system with respect to our your line of sight, then during this passage of this, uh, the system along your line of sight, you will see this caustic lines. So you will, you will, you will see the very high magnification in the, in the image, in the, in the, in the light coming from the source. Mm -hmm. That's the signature of the binary lensing, and then we can identify the parameters of the lens, and then conclude that the, the binary is a normal star or the or the uh, the companion is a planet so this has been uh, one of the standard methods for the for the exoplanet detection so since almost 10 years uh, some uh, survey group groups like Ogle, Moa or Chemnet they monitor billions of stars in the galactic bulge they they detect about 3,000 microlensing events per year. And then uh, 
they can they can identify the microlensing events that has anomalies. The anomalies means that they they can they can predict that there will be a caustic crossing, and then they uh, report it to the follow-up telescopes. We are using this this telescope um, for the follow-up observations. So this is the telescope that we are using. That's 1.5 meter inch telescope, and it's just a follow-up follow-up observation. We choose that that events, not this telescope. There are other telescopes. There, there are, the, there are uh, uh, about 10 uh, follow-up telescopes. They took the, the, the ongoing microlensing event and then uh, monitor it with very high accuracy and a bit short cadence to identify this uh, light curve and then to derive the parameter of the lens. So this is one some samples of the microlensing events. And here you will see the caustic crossing. And this is also some anomalies happen at just at the peak. So all these are the signature of the binary lens and some of them are uh, the, the, the companion is a planet. And with this method, uh, people could discover about uh, 60 to 70 uh, exoplanets by gravitational microlensing. So this is, uh, again, this is a caustic line on the source plane and on the sky and the source just crossing this caustic line and makes uh, infinite magnification. Actually, this is, uh, in reality, it's not infinite because of the wave optics effect. So it's a, a very large magnification that I will introduce, uh, just uh, give the reason, that I will tell the reason that why it's not uh, really this, there is no singularity. Um, so, um, well, uh, So in what follow, I just want to introduce gravitational microlensing as a natural amplifiers for discovering ETI. ETI means uh, the planets that the planets that they have uh, uh, life there, like us, and then they are producing uh, radio waves. And uh, the idea is that can we detect these radio waves uh, using the gravitational microlensing? And you can see the detail of this work, uh, this stuck in this paper. So uh, let's assume that uh, there are uh, advanced civilizations that they have almost the same technical capability like us, that they can generate telecommunication radio signals. So uh, the, uh, the specification, specification of the radio signals that we are generating is that we are generating very narrow band signals delta lambda over lambda is 10 to minus 12 in the range of 100 megahertz to 1 gigahertz and um, so the, the 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 wavelength associated to this, to this is 0.3 to 3 meter wavelength and then uh, we we generate we just Put information on the on the radio radio signals by modulation in the frequency, which we call it FM, or modulation in the amplitude that we call it AM. So this is the the, the way that we are transmitting information. So it's a narrow band, it's a narrow band, and also there is a modulation in the frequency or modulation in the amplitude, depending on the and the and the way that we are transmitting data. So this is just assumption that uh, let's assume that there is an advanced civilization just similar to us in a very distant uh, places in the in our galaxy. So um, there are radio, there are a leakage of radio radio signals that's unintentional, like like what we are producing, and uh, there are some of the sources that that they leakage to the that leak to the to the space. So like military um, uh, stations, transmitters like FM or TV. So this is the range of frequency that they are producing, 400 megahertz in this range for the FM, TV. And this is the number of the transmitter that we have on the, on the our planet, maximum power that they are generating. And sometimes also uh, uh, some people generating very strong radio signals that are sending to the sp space. 
large, like RCBO observatory that they're transmitting very strong radio signals like 20, 20 terawatts signals in this range or 2.5 terawatts they just send these pulses to the to the to, to our galaxy that anybody can hear us so let's imagine that they also there are also some um, civilization over there and they're producing similar signals that we that we are producing so um Uh, next slide. Not coming. Okay. So, fortunately, cosmologists uh, are interested in to see this, the universe in 200 to 400 megahertz. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, okay. So, fortunately, cosmologists are interested in to look at the universe in 21 centimeter. So, why? Because that's the area of the universe, that's uh, the reionization area, that uh, the hydrogen molecules, that uh, atoms actually, they emit 21 centimeter. And if we just take into account the redshift of this reionization area at redshift of 6 to 12, that corresponds to the 200 to 400 megahertz. And if you just compare to the table that I put for the radio transmission that we are producing, that's in the range that we are producing our signals. So it's exactly in the FM or in the TV frequencies. So it, that's, that's a good coincidence uh, in this to in this two frequency or this two wavelength. So this is a, a SKA radio um, uh, network. They are going to observe 21 this frequency, exactly 200 to 400 megahertz. And it's uh, exactly the same frequency that, are, that we are producing on Earth or some advanced civilization producing in our galaxy. So this is a very good coincidence. And the, the, we, we should note that uh, we are the, the, the frequency that the, this, the electromagnetic wave that we are producing in this in this range, or outshine the, the the sun. So if there is a advanced civilization that will outshine the parent star, so we will see, we may see this um, uh, signals from the from the advanced civilization. So what? Um, Gravitational lensing can help and can do this. So uh, actually, that's that that that's going to uh, to be to use as an amplifier. So this is uh, one of the areas of the uh, radio telescopes, MWA. Uh, this radio telescope is, uh, for instance, uh, uh, for a source at the frequency of 200 megahertz. This is the sensitivity of the or threshold of the uh, of this telescope, 0.4 millijanski with this uh, frequency range, and this is the exposure time. In the gravitational microlensing, our mainly our exposure time is 10 minutes because that's optimized for the Cauchy crossing. So all the telescopes has the cadence or or exposure time of 10 minutes or the cadence of 10 minutes if we just include this readout time for the CCD, it's 10 minutes. And this is optimized for the caustic crossing. So if we just use, adapt that strategy of observation and take the 10 minute exposure time for the caustic crossing of a, of a planet that, that crossing the caustic line of a binary system, then this is the minimum power that we can detect. So um, actually, uh, this is if we just put 10 to 13 watt for the station uh, at the distance of V and the frequency band of this and the total and the exposure time of 10 minutes, then uh, this is the this is the this is the minimum uh, actually uh, the, the power that we can detect. Okay. 
now the idea is that uh, let's assume that uh, there is a there is a sun-like star and there is an earth-like planet orbiting around it and here is the observer looking we are sitting here and then we have a lens here just moving along this plane and in the case of a single lens we'll have uh, this kind of magnification and if we have a binary lens we will have a caustic chrome and the idea is that uh, can we just uh, look this uh, 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 micro lensing events in the case of binary lensing and uh, just de detect and then uh, just uh, follow up these events in the uh, in the radio uh, with, the, with the radio telescope for detection of signals coming from this planet. So that's the main idea. And. Uh, Okay, but the point is that the problem is that uh, when we are going to the longer wavelength, the gravitational lensing uh, in the gravitation, the electromagnetic wave, uh, when the electromagnetic wave is in the order of Schwarzschild radius, uh, we should take into account the wave optics. So if, if, uh, if we increase the wavelength, that then there will be uh, scattering and that, that the light rays will not follow the geometric optics. So the Schwarzschild radius of the uh, lenses is about three kilometer, normalized to the multiply to the mass of the lens, and uh, for the for the stars, that's the Schwarzschild radius is in order of kilometer. Just take into account that the wavelength that we are interested in to, to observe is in order of meter. So that will just scatter the gravitational. Uh, that will just scatter the electromagnetic wave. That will not produce this gravitational lensing. So, and if our, our lens is in Jupiter mass, Schwarzschild radius is in, is, is in the order of meter, and for the Earth's mass, that's centimeter. So, most of the lenses are brown dwarf sizes, and then the Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild radius is in the order of meter to kilometer. So, if the Schwarzschild radius is in, is in the order of kilometer, that will just scatter the, the electromagnetic wave, the wavelength of three meter. Uh, sorry, sorry. If 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 uh, sorry, so if uh, if the Schwarzschild radius is is in the order of meter, that will scatter the electromagnetic wave in the order of meter. But in the in the case of kilometer, we will have a gravitation. We will have a lensing. Uh, and uh, if you want to uh, calculate this gravitational lensing with with, uh, with properly with detail then we should look at the propagation of electromagnetic wave in the in the in the in the uh perturb Minkowski space that i discussed in this this uh, electromagnetic wave propagation in detail in this in this paper and in the case of uh, schwarzschild radius uh, in the case of a single lens uh, that will uh, simplify to this equation for the magnification, instead of having very uh, small magnification, we'll have uh, some uh, uh, fringes in the magnification. And that uh, Dr. Mehravi worked on this uh, topics in his thesis. And this is the, the profile of this magnification. So we should take into account the wave optics also in this calculation, because sometimes like, the lens is, is small, there's the size of the Schwarzschild radius of the uh, lens is, is comparable to the three meter. That is, that's uh, what we are looking for in this uh, observation. So, um, so in what follows, I'm doing just statistical uh, simul analysis, and then uh, to to see that uh, what is the uh, chance of detecting this kind of uh, signals. Um, actually, this is the uh, Characteristic, characteristic size of orbit, orbital radius of planet. Um, if we if we if we just project it on the lens plane and normalize to the Einstein radius, this is the size of the uh, orbital orbital radius of the planet, or that's that orbiting around the parent star. And then if we put if for the RH we use the habitable zone for the source stars. That it goes with this, the square of the mass of the source star, 
then uh, uh, we can see that uh, what uh, what is the chance of detecting a, a planet with a habitable zone and having an advanced civilization. Um, so this is the um, detailed Monte Carlo simulation in this uh, study. And uh, we should simulate the gravitational microlensing in the galactic, toward the galactic, toward the galactic body. And uh, at the end, uh, we, we, we assume uh, 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 an advanced civilization orbiting around the source stars. And then by the gravitational lensing, we want to see if we can, if the flux that we are receiving from this uh, planets is, is, is larger than the, the threshold of our radio telescopes. Um, and so this is the result for the for the single lens. I'm just uh, reporting this uh, result. So this is the this uh, solid line is the distribution of the source stars towards the galactic bulge, and the dotted uh, dotted uh, histogram is the distribution of the the dashed line is the uh, ETI signals that we can detect everything around the source star and for 2.5 percent of events we'll have enough magnification of the signals coming from advanced civilization to detect them and the, the and the point is that if you look at this distance so we can detect with our radio telescopes signals up to up to a uh, few kiloparsecs up to for instance eight eight kiloparsec to up to 10 kiloparsec we can detect this kind of signals coming from advanced civilization and that's due to the magnification in the gravitational lensing and uh, this is my last slide uh, so the main reason the main result is the binary lenses and the projecting signal is really high the reason is that we can identify binary lenses in advance. So during in the in the microlensing surveys, we can identify the binary binary lenses in advance. And once they are alerted, then uh, we can follow up them. Binary lenses they have caustic lines. They are very uh, standard caustic lines. And and uh, and the planet with the uh, advanced civilization will cross these caustic lines. And if we perform our Monte Carlo simulation for the binary lenses, for 85% of cases, we get caustic crossing of planet with the caustic lines. And uh, that's very interesting. For instance, uh, if for, for each, each year we have 3,000 um, uh, microlensing events, and we expect that for 50 of them, we can detect caustic crossing of binary of a of a uh, uh, of a, uh, ETI with the binary lens with the, with the caustic lines of binary lens so this is uh, my uh, observational proposal that I, I propose this to the SKA people and the MWA people and uh, the, the the proposal is, is as follows that uh, gravitational microlensing is a natural amplifier of the ETI, and the, and the advantage of binary microlensing events is that that will enable us to detect caustic crossing of planets orbiting around the source, and the chance of this caustic crossing is eighty five percent, and that will amplify signal coming from the ETI, and we can run this SKA or MWA telescope with the target of opportunity mode, and then just follow up this uh, microlensing events. With the binary lens, and each year we expect to to, to observe or to uh, observe about 50 microlensing events with the binary lens. I mean, if we consider the 85 percent of chance, that will be um, 85 percent multiplied to 50. So that in that in uh, about 40 40 microlensing for 40 microlensing events will have a uh, uh, caustic crossing. And uh, 
The advantage is that we'll be able to observe possible ETI signals in the SETI project in a, from a very far distances of our, of our galaxy, up to a few kiloparsec uh, far from us. Okay, so um, that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Sohrab. And we have uh, time for one or two questions. There is one question here. Can you read it, Sohrab? Or? Uh, binary microlensing means that there are two planets in the. Binary microlensing means that we have binary star. We have binary star. And uh, there is one more question uh, from Fatima. Can you, uh, Puria, can you open her microphone, please? Uh, hi, Saurabh. Uh, oh. Thank you for the interesting talk. So I, I was wondering what is the uh, SETI's uh, sensitivity uh, in order to detect uh, the signals you need and what sigma level you would predict to detect these uh, uh, microlensing events? Um, actually, I use the threshold of this uh, uh, different telescopes like SKA or MWA. So okay. I just use this, these two telescopes to see what is the advantage of using this microlensing. So uh, we, without that, okay, without that, we could up to 100 parsec. And if you have a caustic crossing, you can go to the kiloparsec. Few kiloparsec. So in yeah, I have in one of my slides, my slides. Um, uh, so here, um, Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so it, it does not give. Uh, yeah, because it does not give you the uh, sense of Jansky levels uh, to to compare and to have a kind of a feeling about the detection here. Um, it's it's uh, it's expressed in terms of uh, time only. Yeah, that was my question actually. But we can discuss it later. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you so much again, and uh, if you. there's nothing more, we can go for the next talk. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. So the next is...